Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you for coming. We are excited to have you. Um, we'll introduce ourselves more formally in a moment, but um, I'm Dan Shapson, and this is Ava Sanders, and um, thankfully, one is not the loneliest number today. Um, we uh, decided to um, think through this session uh, and, and title it when we did focus on our topic today um, because, um, as Kate pointed out, I'm going to use this today, and, and you may hear it again tomorrow during the plenary because I loved it, but, you know, externships are young. We are the, I think that was your word you used to describe it, fresh. We are, um, at least in my view, the here and the now, and um, we are getting calls all around for more. Um, ABA standards is not the only call requiring experiential coursework, but employers want more practice readiness. Our students are clamoring for on-the-job training and exposure to potential employers. And yet, beyond our schools and our students and, and local lawyers, seemingly everyone else calling for more. Um, for many of us, one sort of fundamental reality still remains unchanged, and that is that we, many of us, remain the only ones um, doing what we are doing at our schools. And I'm seeing some heads nodding, and even if not, I suspect that is the case for, for many of us. We are the only leaders, teachers, doers of externships at our law schools. And um, Avis and I, um, having gotten to know each other uh, now many years ago, realized, as we'll tell you in a moment, that while we are situated differently at our law schools, and um, I'll tell you more about that, um, we reflect that reality as well. So I wanted to introduce ourselves in that context and then tell you just briefly what uh, we're gonna talk through today and, and, and hopefully um, uh, work together with you to do and, uh, and go from there. Yes. Okay. <laughs> we had a little discussion about standing and sitting. And yeah. I asked notes on my but, computer. Because it's 4.20 and, and we're all, we got to be awake, right? <laughs> right? So I just want to start by um, addressing addressing the problem for a minute. So, oh, okay. nope, we can't get Oh, oh, got it. Okay. So um, let's actually start with, I'm going to talk a little bit just about my school, what I do. Daniel will talk a little bit about his school, what he does. Um, I'm, um, uh, I teach at American University Washington College of Law, I direct the externship program, I teach the externship seminar, huge program, we have 350 to 400 students a year um, doing externships, so big, big program. Notwithstanding the fact that pretty much every student in the school is doing an externship, um, I am in my own little world, and uh, so I, uh, make, I make all of the decisions uh, around externships. I, you know, the, the faculty are appointed, but I interview and I make the recommendations, and you know, so I'm doing all of this. But in all of that, I'm by myself. Um, the clinical program is separate. I'm not part of the clinical program, uh, so I just have my own little world, and and basically. Nobody really knows what I do. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I am uh, at the University of Memphis, Cecil C. Humphreys of Law. I am called an associate professor of law and the director of experiential learning. I am a tenured professor uh, and um, I direct an in-house litigation clinic that I've always taught. Uh, I direct a program, uh, an in-house clinical program that has uh, five other um, what we call in-house clinics that are uh, three other litigation clinics and two other uh, a mediation clinic and then a, an adjudication clinic whose students sit as hearing officers and um, all of those are directed themselves by full-time faculty. Um, and then there is the externship course that is part of our experiential program and I am the only um, professor uh, or full-time faculty member that has anything to do with the externship course. Um, like Avis, uh, I am the only one in my law school who has any idea what is going on with the externship course. Um, so we wanted to do that. 
uh, I have a program that has generally 30 to 40 during uh, students during the fall and spring <coughs> semesters and about 60 to 65 the last couple of summers. So we are a three semester externship course. Um, so we wanted to spend a little bit of time with you today unpacking this idea of isolation um, as externship teachers and purveyors. Um, uh, we um, have characterized this sort of, at least in our discussions, this idea of isolation um, as something that has historically uh, uh, been at play in our programs at our respective institutions. And I think we've come to a place in our discussions about this program um, uh, of thinking that the, the um, by better understanding sort of the siloed existence that many of us find ourselves in, uh, its causes, its manifestations, um, that we, we can be sort of more informed about uh, and thoughtfully address um, the opportunities that we think are more um, present than ever to enhance both our uh, lives as uh, externship teachers, um, personally our lives as, as the trainers of law students, but also enhance our programs. Um, and uh, that is our premise, that um, there are opportunities at play that extend just from the reality that many of us operate within, the notion that we are the ones doing this, the only ones doing this, this being externship coursework, um, and that there are benefits to uh, an isolated existence, and that by understanding where we can seize on those benefits, but also the advantages that might come from collaboration with others and fostering that collaboration as a means, at least to uh, move away from some of the isolation, that we can be better. So we want to just quickly roadmap, spend a little time considering the problem, um, exploring what isolation may mean for you, for us, personally, professionally, programmatically, consider in some more depth um, the risks and opportunities that we think are tied to a siloed existence uh, and the causes, and then transition to um, an exploration of some possibilities for integration and collaboration, and talk with you about some of the tactics that we have used in our programs to enhance um, externship uh, coursework and, and just our externship programs through that collaboration and a more collegial approach to, uh, and affirmatively more collegial approach to um, seeking out those relationships. So um, one, one last thing um, that I, I um, added here, and that is, um, while it would be justified, I think Avis and I are hoping that this is not going to be a session that focuses on negative. Um, we uh, have tough existences as clinicians, certainly as externship faculty and, and directors, um, but we are, uh, again, to go back to what Kate said, we are young and we are fresh. We are, we are the it, um, I believe, and there's a real opportunity to um, help others understand what we are doing in a way that benefits us, that benefits our students and benefits our law schools. And I believe more than ever, the time is now for that. Um, and uh, so uh, we will, I think, be fairly collective in our embrace of some of the circumstances we all face and thinking about them. But our hope is that you'll walk away um, with at least some uh, thoughts and ideas about how to seize on a platform that may be a more isolated one and go back and uh, spread the word and the gospel about our programs and our pedagogy and our opportunities in a way that, that makes us better, makes your day to day better. So, it is. So the first thing I want to say is we're going to talk a little bit, but mostly we would like this, this is one of those uh, sessions where it's really meant to be something where all of us are talking and talking about the issues that we have. If you came to this session, the chances are you are feeling a little isolated. Right? You, why would you come here? <laughs> so, <laughs> I, I, I came because we're on the opposite ends of the spectrum. And so, I wanted to see what the isolation looks like. Oh. And sh maybe share, and share some of it. Fabulous. That is so great. Um, I thought uh, I was going to maybe hear about other programs that were way more integrated <laughs> so I get some more ideas, but that's okay. This is um, um, similar. I am the only person with the externship title. 
we have more integration happening. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's terrific. So I think what we'll do is we're going to talk a little bit about what the challenges are when you are isolated, and then what does it look like when you're not isolated, Little and do a little pros and cons, because sometimes isolation is not a bad thing, right? So let's, we're going to look at, at both sides of that. And then also, both of us have experiences that helped us get out of the isolation. And so we're going to, we want to talk about that. But here, that's really what we wanted to do, was to hear from people as to, you know, okay, rather than, oh, here's a problem. Well, we're done with that then, right? Here's the problem, and where are we going to go, and how can we, how can we move from there? And, but in answer to the question, really, I think uh, the problem for many people is actually pretty severe. Uh, I think that there are a lot of uh, people who are in their externship programs and don't have an opportunity to uh, work with their colleagues the way maybe their colleagues often do. You know, at my school we have a big clinical program and they're talking to each other, talking to each other. They have weekly meetings, right? And until I went to those meetings, I was not meeting with, uh, meeting with, with me, <laughs> all right? I'm the externship person, so I'm going to have a meeting. There wasn't going to be a lot of people there. And I think it's really common that at many, many schools, there is one person who has the responsibility over externships. You may do a lot of things the way Danny does. You may have a big program. You may just do externships the way I do. But in that externship role, Often we are the only people who are doing it. And so uh, opportunities for collegiality don't just fall in our laps. We've got to create them. Otherwise, we are alone. Um, I remember once coming out of one of these conferences, and I was at the airport, and I overheard somebody talking on the phone, and clear to me after just a minute that this was an externship person. And as she was talking, I almost wanted to hug her because I understood every single part of her conversation. And I was like, yes, I know you. Because so often that's not my experience, right? Um, when I said that you know, nobody knows what we teach, I think there is a lot of truth to that, that people don't understand you know, let, the, let alone the stand-up the stand faculty, but let, not even the clinicians don't understand what we are doing in the seminar component or the, you know, however, the supervision component um, of the externship program. They're, they don't know what we're teaching. And, and there's a real loss there because if we are looking to see, well, what, what do students need when they graduate? What is it that we expect them to have? And if we're not all talking to one another to make sure that everybody's covering each piece, then easily students can walk out the door and not get what they need. But if we're talking to each other, we can say, oh, you know what? Nobody's covering this. You know, let's look through. You know, you look at the McRae report. Everything getting there, right? And so it is really important uh, uh, for our programs and for our students, but also, and I it's very important for us personally because what I have heard over the years, over and over again, is that people feel very isolated in their jobs. And we know from, uh, you know, we know from Larry Krieger, when we talk about happiness and what makes people happy in their jobs, uh, a sense of collegiality, of teamwork, of a shared mission. Uh, those recognition. Are recognition, absolutely, right big thing that sometimes doesn't happen in the externship world. Those are all, because if they don't know what you do, it'd be hard to recognize you. Um, and those are all uh, you know, things that are important to us personally as well. And we want to be, um, you know, we, we want our programs to be successful. We want our students to be successful. But we also want to create, you know, we also need to be the happy lawyer, right? We also need to be um, enjoying our jobs. Um, so we wanted to start off by, um, first of all, just talking about what the actual challenges are. And I thought for that, I would actually throw it open to you. For those of you who do feel like there are issues with isolation and that you're not quite you know, sure what, what to do about them, just to tell us what, what is the situation, um, you know, how, what is the, the situation in, at your school in terms of iso you know, um, isolation? Are, are there issues that you're, 
within your schools. <laughs> yeah, I thought I would sit isolated. Yeah, <laughs> you did that well. Yeah, you're, it's a good example. But I'm sorry. No, good example. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I'm new to externships. I was a clinical law professor and clinic director for many years, and uh, um, director of experiential learning. But this is the first time I'm doing externships. And what I realized is that you know it's so funny having been a clinical law professor and then being externships, and especially a clinical law professor in the days when externships wasn't the field that it is now. So right. it really was more about, sure, go do it, you know, give you a few credits and go talk to us about it. And is is trying to convince starting with my clinical colleagues, because I figured they'll be the most receptive, right? You know, people that this is really this has become a pedagogy and that people really are very, very thoughtful about what we're teaching students and what an externship means and that it's not just throwing people into the field, but it's actually thinking thoughtfully about what they should do when they get there and how we support them through a seminar. Um, and, you know, that's about as, first of all, like the faculty don't even know me and I don't know them, but at least starting with the clinical faculty, I think, you know, sort of with who you think might be your closest colleagues trying to, you know, kind of say we've come a long way, baby, and right. we need to know about that. And I'd like to teach you and get your support. Not teach you, but collaborate with you. I actually give a presentation to the clinical faculty, and the way I tried to, you know, kind of do it was to say, I need your help. I'd like to know what do you think right. is important to be teaching our students, because I'd like to see if we can incorporate that into what we teach right. in the externship. I'd like to look at your syllabi, you know, to see. You know, can I take some of the general principles from yours and say those should be in the extra ship? Sure. You know, maybe as well. <coughs> say we could be in this together. Where do you, where do you sit? Uh, do you sit with other faculty? Do you... um, I'm in the right. So there are actually I'm at Columbia Law School. Okay. And there's uh, both a you know faculty building and administrative right. building. I'm in the faculty building. Uh -huh. um, truthfully, I'd rather be in the administrative building. I, and I'm actually trying to move there because I feel like they're dealing with issues with students that are closer in a certain way to what I'm looking at than what the faculty is. Right. Interesting. Oh. And one thing I, I did note here, so because I, I uh, was writing down, like one was to let people know that there's teaching actual pedagogy. But then as a little side note, you mentioned that you didn't know the faculty. And I think that's a thing that we need to put up. That's, a, that's an issue that many people face. Right. So, one other thing you just said at the end, and I think we all probably feel this, the problems that we have to deal with, I say problems, the issues that we have to deal with with our students as externs are different. They are different than certainly what our doctrinal colleagues are dealing with. They're different than what in-house clinicians deal with when they're providing the direct supervision. There may be a third party or more than one that's reporting concerns to us about the conduct of a third party in an environment that doesn't have us doing the monitoring, right? So um, sort of as a cause, we're thinking about ways in which we might feel isolated, right? The, the sort of distinctive nature of, of how we structure our programs and where our students are and how we monitor, right? Certainly, I can talk down the hall, I can run down the hallway and talk to five or six of my colleagues about an issue in a piece of litigation that I'm handling or the role of student might be playing or not playing in a, in a case that our law clinic is supervising and, and handling. But I don't know that I can have that came, same conversation comfortably with anybody on that same hallway about that. Well, well, you asked the question of whether you asked Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. So that I was intentional. So if you could tell us that when you. When you, when yeah. you like. But how about you? Tell us your. I'm a clinic guy. I'm here to watch. Oh. <laughs> and here with our clinic executive director says to us. Good. Um, no, I, I, we, we all live through this in many different ways. Yeah. And, and uh, you lived through, I was successful at my school in Arizona a number of years ago. Um, you know, you, you, you get that and, and you all treat it differently. But I think that, that question that you asked is like the most important question. Oh, yeah. The externships is, is where are you? Right. Physically. Yeah. So, um, so 
Colleen, uh, where are you? Um, so I'm Amanda Bynum. I work in the Career Development Office. So we are in the, near the administration, near admissions and the registrar. Um, I don't particularly feel isolated, uh, but I came from running the criminal defense clinic um, as a part-time professor of practice while I worked full-time. So I felt very welcomed into their clinical community and um, still attend their, their bi-monthly clinical meetings and am involved with what they're planning and what they're talking about and give feedback. Um, I think there's definite benefit to being housed with career development, um, but the barriers are that they're very, um, not a welcoming environment, like students have to make an appointment and they have to walk through like several doors to get to me. And so in that regard, um, that makes it difficult to connect with the students. So I have to put myself out there. And one of the ways I do that is by advocating to let them, to, to have the school let me teach classes. So I teach trial advocacy, which helps me connect with the students more that way also. And is there an externship seminar? Um, right now, it's an online component, but it's in the process. Um, I'm planning. Uh, we have a, a seminar on the course schedule for next fall. Will you teach that? Yes. Uh, and there's no other externship people at the school, although some of our students are supervised by faculty. Um, about 10 of the 35 in my course are supervised by faculty. All right, who else? We get, by the way, all separate session on, on that reality. <laughs> yeah, the back. I'm kind of the weirdest hybrid known to mankind. Um, I'm a doctrinal faculty teacher. I also am in the legal writing, which is another unit that's sometimes been marginalized. And I'm the director of externships. So um, I sit with the faculty, but the faculty has no clue what I do. Right. And, um, which is a blessing and a curse, exactly what you're right. talking about. Um, but it, it's unique in the sense that I can engage with them much easier because I hate to say this, not the, we have sort of distinctions between our clinical faculty, um, some are part members of the faculty, some who are directors and who are um, attorneys in the, the respective clinics, they're not. And I've seen them at functions where faculty are like, and you are, you know. Um, so they don't say, and you are to me. <laughs> like, um, if I wasn't me, I would be. Mm -hmm. If that makes any sense. Yeah. Right. Because, okay. you're, because you are doctrinal faculty, you don't have that issue. Right. Right. So. Yeah. So I'm similar. I am an uh, assistant director of LRW and director of externships okay. and director of competitions. And I teach classes. So <laughs> it's whatever you know nobody else wants to do, I get to do. Right. Um, I know my faculty, they know me, they're very nice to me. They'd be okay if I wasn't there. They don't know what I do. They don't care what I do. Uh, experiential education has been crammed down their throat. Right. And they are not happy about it. Um, but um, I'm on the third floor with the rest of the faculty. Uh, I get to be called faculty. I get to vote in most of the things in the faculty meetings. And the things I can't, then I am ex literally excused from the room. Yeah while um, they vote, so. Something you said there, um, and this may be, you know, for more to our discussion in a couple of minutes, but you, um, I heard some positive about nobody knowing what you do, but I also heard some sort of negative reality, which is um, you're doing all those other things, and they're not just things, right? right? Running competitive teams, teaching LRW, uh, you list lots of things, and um, and then externships, which we all know could be its own thing, and the only thing. So, um, so my dean know. often says, when I leave, he will hire two other people. Right, right, right. And, and, with straight, and with a straight face, sort oh, yeah. of joking. Yeah, no, right. I think he's serious. Right, oh, oh. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, I've noticed some competitiveness with the clinical program that they feel like students are choosing yeah. externships mm -hmm. over yeah. clinics. Yeah. Yeah. And also, I've heard articulated that clinics are better than externships. Yeah. So. We have a little bit of that, or a lot of bit of that at, at my school too, right? 
Um, some of that, I think, comes from being the only person yeah. that teaches externship. There is strength in numbers, and there's strength in historically being of the two, right? The more recognized, at least of the two, right? And how's clinical teaching? Adam, did you have your, your head up? Yeah. Um, so I am the assistant director of career and professional development okay. at St. Thomas in Minneapolis, and also externship person. Not sure what my title is. Person. Is. Person. Um, <laughs> So I added manager for externship courses onto my email, so people know that. Um, right. I'm not sure else to do. So I have a different level of potential isolation where I am a staff member. Um, so I have inserted myself into curriculum committee meetings and faculty meetings and things like that. I've been asked to leave the room occasionally, which is fine. Right. And sometimes it's just don't, I don't come back. Right. <laughs> That's good. I'm just gonna I'll, take... I'll see you guys later. Yeah. Yeah. I'm gonna take... go ahead. No, no. But um, so there's there's. Something that I would suggest, though, to everyone in this room is I, I'm hearing um, collaboration with colleagues and other faculty members and things like that. If your career office is doing what it should be doing, your overlap is high. Um, we, we have teachable moments that match up almost exactly on a regular basis. Um, so if you're looking for someone to collaborate with and partner with, I would urge you to collaborate with your career services office. Um, We'll just point that your doors are closed. Oh, yeah. I'm disappointed yeah. too. Yeah. I think the whole wall would be inside. That's no bad. <laughs> we have, I mean, I have, I, I advise half of our class on career issues, half of each class. So I have a direct connection to half of our students, and the person in the office next door has a direct connection to the other half. So we have a touch point that not many people in the building have. So I would urge you to look into that and maybe to. Mm -hmm. and talk about and yeah. So I'm housed in the experiential program, experiential learning program. Um, I'm on the first floor and I mean but we're scattered all over. I'm my I'm under the auspices of the experiential learning program, but there are only a few of us that are actually in the wing that I'm in. Um, it's a small wing, but it's nice to have that. And it's not too far from the first services office. And we do work with our public interest law program and our first services office. As well as a lot of faculty, historically, they're, they're happy to be getting away from that because we started courses now. But, um, but still feel it's a big school, a big law school at UCLA. And it still, I think, feels siloed. That's what I was going to ask you. Is like so, you're placed with other people, but the I'm still the only one doing that. Right. 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 Yeah. yeah. So yeah. you still have that issue. Right. Yeah. And do you feel? And do you feel? It sounded like you feel it. Like, you know, do you? Do you? Are you? Do you on a regular basis think to yourself, "Gee, it would be nice if I had somebody who I could talk to and to who I was working with." Yeah. And I yes. You know, but and I also feel like even though we work with some of the other parts of the law school that I think maybe because everybody's busy or people historically have been so siloed, it, it still feels like there's just not enough communication and collaboration to make us all really effective. And I feel like that's true about core services, it's true about our public interest law program. I just feel like people don't stop to think, yeah. oh, well, I should let someone know about that or the dean of students. I mean, you know, there's, there's sort of, because I'm sort of faculty, but I mean, I'm, in a, a non-tenure track uh, faculty member, but <coughs> an administrator at the same time. I mean, I teach it. I run another academic program and teach in it. Mm -hmm. And I think people just, it, you feel intellectually, emotionally isolated, even yeah. if you're sitting with other people. Because people just mm -hmm. don't stop to think that mm -hmm. how much overlap there is um, with our student interaction, our That's employer right. interaction. Sure. Sure, did you hear? Somebody, did somebody have over here? I had a hand up. I feel the isolation when an issue comes up and I think a policy decision or interpretation relating to the externship program has to be made. Mm -hmm. If it related to the clinical program, we have six clinics and the six clinic directors would discuss it. Maybe they would share duties like you go analyze the ABA mm -hmm. standards and you look at the literature and you call up some other right. clinic people, let's get together and brainstorm on it. There's just me. Are you deferred to as the authority? On those issues? I have two places I go. I go to the associate dean for academic affairs. She's my boss. Right. I have monthly meetings with her. I feel like I have to bring her these kind of questions. Sure. This is what I think we should do. 
she's wonderful in many ways, but I don't think she's well informed about what a wise yeah. externship program would do. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of, you know, I don't know what answer she'll give me, and sometimes it's go find more information for me. Sure. Well, I guess I'm asking the question, and this is maybe for everybody, I don't know, show of hands or what it might be, but um, is there anybody here who is, is the only person or one of a small group of, of externship folks who doesn't get to make calls on policy decisions for your program? Go ahead. No, I, I think you know, the uh, Colombian never had a director of externship, right. so that was created in November. And then in December, they created a vice dean of experiential learning. Uh -huh. um, so now I report to that person right. who reports to the dean. Um, and also at Columbia, I mean, every new course has to go before the faculty. Right. So if, if I created, we don't have a general externship, we have field clinics. Right. If I created that and I created a seminar, it would have to have get to faculty through, right. approval. Right. So, you know, changes, if I change something from Ungraded. Would you present that? What? Would you present it to the faculty? You know, again, I'm new. Yeah. So my assumption would be that I would do that with the vice dean. Right. You know, that we would do that. And, and there is a, there's actually an adjunct curriculum committee as well as a, you know, a curriculum committee, okay. you know, for faculty. Mm -hmm. um, right now, the externships have been considered adjunct yeah. faculty. So it does, it does go through that. Who teaches and what they teach. I'm listening, and I love the fact that there are not two people in this room who have the same yeah, setup. Right. Like, no, not right. that. Um, Jody, did you want to say something? Uh, just to um, that point, so I have a lot of autonomy, um, but I, I share it. Like, I don't want to make these decisions without right. informing the other yeah. people. We're actually a very integrated clinical faculty. I sit with all the clinicians. We have regular lunches. We all, I ran the teaching rounds <coughs> program one semester for the other 12 clinicians um, with a very large clinical program. Uh, and everybody seems genuinely interested and knowledgeable about my program and understands extra pedagogy within the clinical faculty, although not necessarily beyond, because um, we're still somewhat siloed. But to the point of autonomy, I mean, there are a lot of things I just do by myself, right. and I do, but, I per but there are lots of stuff I purposely don't. I bring it to the clinical faculty to talk about, and we have a clinical affairs committee that I sit on, and I, air it there and I make sure people know the decisions I'm making that frankly they just let me do them without question. I'm turning all the companion seminars into letter graded seminars. But I want their input. Sure. So it's good question. So I'm I'm in one of the, 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 the greatest positions I started off is a clinical and um, was the faculty advisor for um, the externship program like 11 years ago. And so now I'm the dean of academics. And I, I'm still a faculty advisor to the externship program. So we're finding that our externship program and our clinical programs are informing our doctrinal classes in bringing active learning into the classroom. We also have, we don't employ anybody who hasn't practiced law. Um, and so what you were talking about with policy decisions, we have four volunteer tenured faculty that are our externship advisory group. So we'll go to the clinical department when we've got some policy questions that we want clinical pedagogy to inform for best practices. But when it comes to practice type things, we go to our faculty advisory committee. And during our ABA site visit, they loved that. Mm -hmm. That the faculty, we weren't making the decision, should I let this guy be a supervisor who had an ethical issue 14 years ago, but has a, had a clean record right. and wants to be a supervisor, I'm not making that decision. The faculty are making that decision, and so that's, that's really helpful. That actually, I think, is a great transition yeah. to the next part of what we wanted to talk about. So we, you may have heard us ask the question, or, or at least assert, I asserted that there are some benefits to isolation. Um, I'm just going to ask, uh, do you agree with that? And if you do, or if you do or don't, um, what are some of those benefits? And I will give you one example, 
And that is um, on some issues, and I know I'm being recorded here. I don't know if that any of my colleagues will ever watch this. Okay. <laughs> but the issue of paid externships at my law school has not come up. And the reason it's not come up is because I have brought it up. Okay? And I don't say that proudly, I say it just, I say it happily for me. It's something that I've, I've betrayed my own, you know, this is my personal view. I, I'm not, it's not a direction I want to go in. It would require lots of, you know, for a variety of reasons. But apart from that, because nobody else is raising the question, that is how attenuated most of the relationship between most of my faculty colleagues in the externship course is. Don't ask, don't tell. Yes, don't ask, don't tell. <laughs> what else? Yes, ma'am. I was going to say, because of the weird position that I'm in, I, it, it's kind of fortuitous that I'm on the, that I'm, I am what I am, and that's all that I am. Um, but is because the faculty has committees that affect externships, right. and if there wasn't a faculty member on it, they would be making these decisions like paid right. externships without my input. Yes. So, like, I am, I am vehemently against it. And so I was doing the exact same thing you were doing, which was not talking right. about it. But the dean said, no, we, we need to have a decision on right. this. And the faculty was generally, sure, sure, let's do it, let's do it. And so if I, at least I got to put my input in before it was like, no, we're not going to do it. Right. And why? And right. how? But that's my fear is in certain areas, yes. it's the faculty making the decisions that's that right. affect other, thing, other right. entities, and they're not looking to them to get any kind of input. Right, and I should say that part of the reason I'm comfortable not bringing, not raising it is because if it does come up from somebody else, it's going to get to me. I'm comfortable with that at my school, with where I am, but I understand that might not be. Uh, that is a risk of isolation, is that you don't get the problems or the issues at all before they're decided for you. And that is certainly something that we think we can work to counteract. I think one of the advantages in my school, because I said I didn't throw it up there, um, that nobody cares. And that's, I mean, that's not true. Though. They're my friends. They just don't care what I do. Um, but I mean, it just sort of, sort of the opposite. If anything came up yeah. with an externship in any capacity, they would just punt it to me. Right. Mm -hmm. So, um, so I, you know, I am the, I'm the voice of externship. So I, I see that as an advantage. I, the disadvantage, obviously, is I don't have other people to bounce sure. issues off of. But, uh, so it's really interesting to me listening to all the different where people are in their school. So I am essentially an office of law. Um, I am an extra person at my school. I sit within the clinical or the experiential wing, which is where 90% of our clinical faculty sit. Um, I do, I report to the Dean for Experiential Learning. Um, under my supervision, I kind of hesitate on that. I have probably a cadre of 10 adjunct faculty and six or seven doctrinal faculty who teach externship courses, seminars, um, that I work with to help develop their, their different syllabi. Um, so I am, Isolated, and yet I would say I have tentacles reaching. I work closely with career services, so I have a counterpart in career services with whom I work. I have a counterpart in the Dean for Students office, so I work, I'm in contact with them pretty constantly. I also, and then with the Dean for Experiential Learning, obviously. So yes, I'm an office of one, but I feel like it spokes to all these different offices. Sure. The benefits of my being the office of one, I get to create courses. Right. So I get to say, you know what, I've noticed that students are interested in this type of externship. I think we should create a course. And so I get to go to, I have, a doctor, let's say it's a course that, you know, one of our tethered courses, I get to go to the doctrinal faculty and say, wondering, would you be interested in collaborating with me on this? tethered course, and this tethered course for us is where the doctrinal faculty is teaching their regular, and for us, large seminar course. Um, and then we have a cohort of students who are out of place and related to that. And that faculty, I train them and work with them on their externship seminar. 
and they teach the seminar for the cohort of six students at in-house council placements simultaneous to them teaching corporations. But it's, to me, it's fun because I get to come up with sure. ideas yeah. and kind of do that. So I think that's a huge benefit. Right. Yeah, I was going to echo that. I'm also an office of one. Right. So the past six years, I've been the assistant dean for public interest law, and then our clinical dean just retired in December, so I took over the externship part of her job. There's still another clinical person, but I'm, you know, I'm in my own office. I have one assistant, but it's, it's literally just the two of us. But that offers a lot of autonomy, which I really appreciate. You know, I, I report directly to our dean. He sort of understands what I do. I think the faculty probably doesn't understand what I do, but they leave me alone. Right. So, yeah. And I get to really direct how I want my day to go and what projects I'm going to work on. Mm -hmm. and, and I also work very closely with our career services office, and that is part of my job as public interest advisor is to do that piece right. of career advising. So yeah, I think I have tentacles in a lot of places, but no one, people aren't usually telling me what to do. Right. And, and by the way, yeah, go ahead. Oh. Just a follow-up question. Yeah. How do you get a faculty member to agree to add to their plate a new yeah. course and that you're not proposing? Get credit for it. We're going to talk about. We're actually going to talk about some of that credit, in, in a couple credit. minutes because I think it's it, it does beg that question. Right. Um, Adam, did you so, have, yeah, one thought on that. Something that's worked for me is letting people know that if something comes up with externships, let me know. I'll worry about it and let you know what you need to worry about right. from there. So the paid externships thing right. came through me. We did pros right. and cons all that, um, but. It also allows me to have some agility and responsiveness to students that I don't know that there's another right. area that offers this. Mm -hmm. um, so if somebody comes in and they maybe didn't do well during their first year of law school, yes. but you know maybe they wrote well or something. There's something you can find, and you know that they're interested in a particular area. Maybe you can find them a placement, give them some way to start building that resume. Yes. Um, whether people want to talk about it or not, employment outcomes is mm -hmm. a cloud that's up there for everybody. Whether you Acknowledge it or not, even if you're a right. tenured professor teaching first year torts, yeah. that is on most evaluations for professors, mm -hmm. I think. We did, we did not talk about that, and I think that is a great one. I think it's, um, I love teaching my clinic, I've done it for years, I'm close to my clinic students, but I think what drives students who might not necessarily ever have taken a course with me yet, to me, is more the externship course. And more the fact that I'm the person that does that, they may have interests they think they want to pursue through certain course of, of externships, they're going to come where they know I have relationships. It might not even be the externship, right? They, they don't want to take the externship. They're interested in a path that's going to get them or make them a better candidate for a postgraduate clerkship. They're going to come, yeah, and we have, we have a faculty supervisor who is charged with that. But I think students are more inclined to come to us for some of those reasons. And I think that's an excellent, excellent point. Quick flip side question. What are the risks of integration? Before we dive into it tactically and think about the positives, what are the risks of integration? I heard somebody mention Paul. Well, those of us who don't run extra programs think we know everything. That's, yes. So, go further. Go further <laughs> and say it. We may intervene with ideas that are yes. something stupid. Yes. You wouldn't. It's possible. <laughs> you would. Yes. Yeah, of course you would. Yeah. <laughs> We all have views, uh, and, and I'm, not, I'm not part of the coding faculty, but, but we all think we know everything we know yep. about education, and we don't know what we don't know. Yeah. And, and you, that can be interfering. Sure. Risk of opening up your program yourself to scrutiny, right? Think about it. If you ever wanted to go tell a tort professor how you think they should change the way they teach their class, mm -hmm. is that, that wouldn't go over well in my law school. But, right, I mean, there is a risk um, if we open up ourselves that way. So, okay. There's also an assumption, and, and I've always felt this as a clinic person, uh, that certain members of my faculty think anybody can do it. <laughs> yeah. And people yes. think anybody can do it. Yeah. Right. And, and that's a really dangerous. I, let me just say, I have just had this situation, I won't name any names, but where. People at the school made some decisions. About, I am not used to, I, am, I run my show, and I am not used to having the other parts of the school come in. And when they suddenly did, and I saw, like, oh, that person's, like, 
what? Like, how would you not want to talk to me about this before you made right. this decision? I know what I'm looking for in an externship professor. I know what matters. And I, you know, when I interview people, I've done, I have, um, in a given year, I have about 30 people teaching externship seminars. So when I interview somebody, I know right away, I'm like, ugh, high maintenance. Doesn't mean I'm not going to hire them, doesn't mean they're not going to be fabulous, but I know right away that they're going to be high maintenance, you know. I've done this a long time. So, like, so yeah, risk of having people come in and then just people who may not know that and who believe that anybody can do this. Yeah, I'm sort of coming from the other side of this. So, um, you know, the school that Matt Mitchell Hammond is a, was created, the combination of two schools, right? William Mitchell College of Law and Hammond University School of Law, neither of which had a full time externship director, each of which had an externship program. And then on the Mitchell side had a residency program, which was just started by a bunch of professors that, right. you know, the Young Turks, like, oh, we should have, like, everyone should do a residency. Right. And not even thinking, maybe this is a form of externship. They're like, oh, these aren't externships, these are residencies. Like, maybe they're semester long externships. Like, that's what they really are, right? You know, it, it, and so trying to, when I was associate dean, trying to convince the dean and convince the combined faculty that we need to have an externship director at this right. school. And we actually negotiated as part of the combination, we got someone to be the externship director. And then about four months later, five months later, he announced he was leaving. And the dean was like, no, we can't afford to hire someone in the right position. So then it was like, what? And so just this very dispersed, like a lot of similar things happening in the oh, yeah. a lot of adjunct taught externships, nobody really knowing what they're doing in there. Right. Mm -hmm. Each have their own design. Right. Mm -hmm. And then this thing called an independent externship that's paperwork that you have to do one on one with the faculty right. member that has been well constructed by clinical professors in the building or whatever, but like it just feels like very right. you know, so I, I two years ago during the externship conference I was here saying like like, oh crap, you know, like our externship director right. is leaving and I don't the dean's not, you know, letting me hire someone what should I do and Fortunately for us, one of our tenured professors was willing to take it over, and right. she's really good. Right. And she's creating policies, right. and she's yeah. you yeah. know like making decisions and yes. making decisions about working with career yeah. professional development office, and you know. But it, it was touch and go for a while there. I, just like yeah. I mean, it's just sort of like curriculum gone wild. Yeah. <laughs> I found a very similar situation when you know ten years ago when I was hired, um, they they didn't have a director for the clinical the in-house clinics, but they were sort of operating on their own, but there was nobody. The externships were, if the professor wanted to supervise a labor law professor supervising the NLRB externship, that's how they did it. And it was a fiefdom of sorts, you know, it was, you know, so um, I think we absolutely faced that, and uh, um, yeah, At you, you point, need to have that leadership. When I, when I started, our program was similar to what you were just describing, where the students would go um, get a faculty supervisor elsewhere, and maybe there was a certain faculty supervisor that always supervised this externship. Um, and I found that it was so confusing yeah. for the students and for the employers, and it was super confusing for me when I came in, because then students would come and ask me questions about externships, placements that I didn't know anything about, because I wasn't really the point person. Right. So I would speak with the, the field supervisor, and then not talk to them again until the end, and then they have multiple contacts at the law school. The students don't know who sure. they're dealing with. And so I guess that's the downside of having it out there, and the solution was to take more control right. over it. And, it. and it's highly political. When you are raised, when you are brought into that situation, right. um, it's almost, it requires individual negotiation to take that back. and. Uh, it sounds like you've and got to a good I just place. Branded. I said, let yeah. me help take right. some work away from you. Yeah. Yeah. And, then, and sometimes I will say that the bar, especially now with the new ABA standards, that that kind of situation, mm -hmm. if you have a site visit, there's a good chance that the bar is going to say, well, right. what are you doing? You know? right. um, let's transition. I see we have 20 minutes left. Um, we, let's transition to tactics. Oh, yeah. Okay, we're going to talk, I'm going to talk really fast. We're both going to just about two things we, we did, right? So one thing I did at my school, I would, I, I'm in like I just I'm in this little silo, right? And a few years ago, I realized like literally, people did not know my name. I would walk down the hall, nobody said hello to me, and I didn't say hello to them. I need to take responsibility here. 
I take, and I need to take a lot of responsibility because I think that you were talking about the tentacles. You know, that's something like I can do. That there are a lot of things when it comes to isolation and when it comes to this whole issue of the fact that we're so, um, you know, none of the experiential people are talking to one another. Like I, I need to take some responsibility for that. So. But meanwhile, I'm walking down the hall and I don't know anybody's name and they don't know my name and I'm working at this school for years, right? This is not a good situation. So, um, I came up with this idea. Uh, we had a problem. We had uh, employers who wanted second year students. They wanted students they could give more advanced work to. Our students can extern after the end of their first year. And I had students who by the time they were second or third year students, uh, year, uh, by the time they were in their second or third year, they knew what they wanted to do. They didn't want to go, I have a big fair, huge big fair. They didn't want to go to that because they knew they wanted to be, work in criminal law, the immigration law, right? So I came up with the idea. It was a two-part idea, mostly on a with students in my office. We were all hanging out, and we came up with this idea together, which was very cool because it was me and the students. On literally a napkin, I drew a, a circle with spokes, and coming out, it's the tentacle idea, and coming out of those spokes, I had alumni and faculty and student groups and uh, OCPD, uh, Career de uh, Development, and I had all the different parts of the school and <laughs> with the externship office in the middle. <laughs> and, uh, and I came up with this idea that we should have subject-specific fairs, that we should bring employers in by subject to meet with upper-level students only, and these would be small fairs. They were not huge, and uh, give, give those people an opportunity to meet I would engage the student groups, so I would talk to the business association and the you know student group and all the different student groups who were involved, get them to make sure that the students were showing up. I would talk to the faculty who coincidentally, right at that exact moment, formed faculty practice groups by practice area. So I would connect up with the faculty of, the, of that practice group. I would find the programs, we have a ton of programs at American University, so I would, you know, find the, the uh, uh, Pigeon is the uh, intellectual property program. So I went to meet with them to talk about the that you know fair, and suddenly I was I had tentacles, and out they went. And then I had a second idea, which was um, to help students with their resumes to bring in alumni, same practice areas before the fair, prepare them for the fair by having them meet with faculty and alumni. And the faculty kind of took over that part of it, but I set it all up and got it running. And so now we had the pre-fair resume review going, and then we had the fair, and um, and now I walked down the hall, and so all the intellectual property faculty knew me, the intellectual property program people knew me, the students who were in the intellectual property society knew me, uh, you know, and this so and and suddenly I wasn't so isolated, and that was it. And the only problem, going back to the risks, now every year I have to put on these pairs <laughs> like I didn't have enough to do. Right. Although, I am thinking this year, and I was thinking about it, that what I didn't do enough of is engage career, the career office. Mm -hmm. you know, that this is something, it's up and running, we all know what it is, and now it's time for me to talk to them because I need to, I need to be doing more in, on the pedagogical side of my program. Right. So, but I got, but but it connected me. And even if I do that, I won't lose the, I won't give up the connection part of it. You know, I'll stay involved because it really, truly changed my experience at the school uh, from after I did that. So that that's my that was my fairly successful. Um, I have. Uh, do I, say? I just wanted to ask Davis, what kind of support do you have? in terms of the oh. administrative assistant? I have one full-time administrative assistant, and I have two dean's fellows who work for hours and weeks of plans. Mm -hmm. And that's it, me and them, and me. And we run a well-oiled machine. <laughs> um, my approach has been a little more uh, in your face. Those of you know me, that may not surprise you, but um, I uh, feel like I am situated a little bit differently, and I've wanted to seize on that. Um, I have some colleagues who are more uh, um, loud in their uh, in their push against experiential. Um, they don't pull back 
at faculty meetings, and they are known to me. And over years, it's, it's sort of evolved that way. Um, there are also some who don't say anything at all. And um, I, I can say that over time, I've been able to advocate successfully for most of what I've wanted to do, both on the in-house clinic side and on the externship side. But I have, with the externship side, really made an effort to reach out to both of those camps um, in a couple of different ways. For those folks who I know are um, less pleased with what's happening on the experiential side, or at least that's how they present to me, um, for a couple of them uh, that teach in substan uh, certain substantive areas, um, I have gone to them to talk to them about the externships that we offer in those areas, positioning them as upper level courses on their upper level courses. For example, our labor, labor law professor teaches labor and employment. That is what he does. And we have a fantastic relationship with our EEOC office three fantastic administrative judges who teach students how to write beautifully, who are to offer totally different supervisory styles. They work as a team in supervising our students. And I have gone to our labor employment professor and asked him to lunch to talk about how it is that our students work with the EEOC and our National Labor Relations Board office. I have asked to come into his class to do a little spiel on the opportunities in those areas that are offered through those agencies and some of the other offices that we work with. I have talked to him about some of our students who have sort of made this progression taking labor law and then our fair employment practices class and then the externships. And we've had a certain number of students who've gone out and now practice in those areas. And in part, attributing that success to the work he's done, but the cultivation that comes with allowing up students to explore those areas further through the externship course. And I've been able to have those conversations um, going with actual data in certain instances with some of those holdout professors. And they have then, in turn, come to really endorse certain placements, believe it or not. And it's worked nicely over the years. I've also gone to um, a professor who I have a great relationship with who directs our Health Law Institute. And we've got a number of great health law externship placements. Sometimes they are hospitals that don't do anything in the way of health law practice, right? But they are healthcare institutions. And she is now going to teach an externship seminar that all of our health law, and it's sort of a broad category, externs are going to take as the companion course. I've been able to talk with her about the reflective exercising we do, about externship pedagogy, and she has loved hearing about it. And she's excited to teach certain substantive topics focused on health law in this course, but also to adopt some of our pedagogical elements in that course. And I'm pretty excited for her to take it over because I've wanted to go in a subject-specific direction for a long time. We've not really been able to do it beyond judicial, a judicial externship section. So, but it's created a collaboration, and now I think she is an ally. She's been an ally, but she is more vocal about, she understands what we do in a different way. So it's been really, really good. Um, we want to ask some, some of you what ideas you have, what collaborations you've been able to form, and how you've strategized, if at all, to maybe pursue integration of your book. And we've heard some of them. Yes. We have the, you know, a few ideas, but are there other, um, other, other ideas that you, that you have that you might want to share? What things you're thinking about too? Yeah, open. Oh. Well, Flattery is one of the things. Right. Yep. And, um, <laughs> it's so true. Uh, we addressed this topic a few years ago at the clinic conference, exactly the same way. And I did a survey of our faculty, and our clinic faculty, and we didn't have an extension in faculty. Um, what would, if you had an opportunity, what would you like to do? Would you like to be a clinic for a semester? Would you like to work in a case? Would you like to be a technical advisor? Um, I also asked the clinic faculty who were remarkably unreceptive to have the faculty come over. Um, but what, what we learned was that there were two people, they were curious, they were yeah. interested. They, they're not, they're curious people by nature. Mm -hmm. So we then approached them, you know, and they became part of it, as I know something Kate does, uh, writing a meetings brief to other students, mm -hmm. uh, working on a particular problem with our students, helping set up an externship um, with our students. Uh, 
just by, you know, hey, little, little baby steps, right. but but by literally sucking up and, and you know, me, I meant it when you said it, you know, hey, you've got all this expertise, you know, you've got all this need. All right. It's okay if the motive is, is an ulterior one. Yeah. You know? I think the practice area thing is really helpful going to your question of how do you convince somebody to do this, right? People who love a certain area of law, like we have a wonderful professor, Lindsay Wiley, who teaches health law. She loves health law. And so very receptive then to anything in that field. And I think that's true. I mean, some people teach very general courses, but for those people who have an area of law that they love, they yeah. often will go out of their way for that. And if you read what they write, yeah. and it fits, you know, I just read your article. Yeah. Well, and by the way, on, on that topic, for we have one professor who part of his course load is devoted to international law. The University of Memphis, we don't have a lot of international law course offerings. We've been able to cultivate some placements that give students exposure to a more international brand of law. He loves it. He's helped me to do it, to reach out. And it does. It, it really does. And he sees it as advancing his you know, area of, of, uh, of pursuit practice and, and, and teaching. So it's good. Um, so I, I have been working with the other schools in the Twin Cities area. Um, Kate in particular, I reached out, I don't know, about a year ago to talk about the ABA standards and things. They were doing and making sure I was on the right track for all that. One thing that happens if you open up within your own realm is uh, potentially a lot more work that you don't get. That's it's true. Very so true. part of my initial conversation with Kate was, is this extra work that I need to do or are right. we on the right track? And mm -hmm. we're on the right track, so I didn't That's have such to a great do too idea. much. But, great you know, idea, so, yeah. and Kate said, well, let's go, so shameless plug, um, I'm speaking with some folks from Mitchell Hamlin on Sunday morning at 8.30, and I'm only saying it because I don't think anyone's gonna show up on Sunday morning today, <laughs> so if you're interested, we can continue this okay, conversation. Right. It's collaboration with career services and, and that kind of thing. But well, it's cross-school collaboration, sometimes where you have the benefit of other schools. It's not always thought of that way. You might not be able to find what you're looking yeah, for inside. Yeah, use collaborative training. Yeah, we're gonna do a, a video training. It, it gives me some credibility, yeah. too, to say, hey, I'm working with these other tenured yeah. professors at other schools, and so, it's not just you know the staff guy in the basement. I think it's such a great solution to the silo problem because everybody understands. Everybody, you know, these are all the people who are the experts in externships, and so it's a way of solving the problem even without you know finding people within your school who, who really may not know the, the, the field as well. Right. And to go out, yeah, you know, we just did this in Washington D.C. as well. So I'm thinking of creating an in-house. Um, externship program with both for profit and non profit organizations with the public service aspect of it. And so that encompasses some of our professors who teach you know, corporate law. It encompasses our career service office who's placing students you know, in these kinds of organizations, and our public service office because the non profit aspect of it applies to them. So it's enabled me to bring a number of different voices into the conversation, yeah. which has been really exciting. And to get, you know, on the career service side, I mean, they know so much about right. where our students want to go and where they have gone and who we have contacts with. And so that's been an exciting to me, you know, experiment on how do I get different, you know, voices in the law school to be interested in the idea of an externship as a vehicle. Yeah, that's great. You know, for advancing, you know, this kind of um, work. And I just want to, before you ask a question, I just want to throw out the words advisory committee um, because I was thinking about creating that for that, this, but I see the pros and the cons. Yeah. Yeah. You, you know, it's so funny advisory about the advisory committee because I'm supposed to have one, and I just, I never have enough time to put it together. I'm supposed to have a group of faculty, and, there, and, it would be, and here I am, I'm whining about isolation. Right. And this is, goes back to, it is my responsibility to do this, you know, that there are people out there who would, in fact, join together and, you know, give me support. And I can't say, like, oh, but I'm too busy to make that happen. I can do that, but then I don't get to whine about being isolated. <laughs> well, one, one thing I, I'm going to get, Kate, and, and Cindy, the, the, uh, towards what Paul was saying earlier, <laughs> I found with some of my faculty, they really, they want a piece of this experiential Thing. They don't know much about it, and so what comes off as kind of an adversarial is it's just a matter of I've not come to them and say, well, hey, if 
you want to be part of this, let's think about how. Mm -hmm. And I've got some really good responses that way, too. Yeah, I was going to say, when I was at, um, before the combination, when I was at Hanlon, I was at Associate Dean for Experiential Education. The person who had been teaching health law um, externship said, I can't do this anymore. And so I went to the director of the Health Law Institute, the faculty, the tenured faculty member, and said, do you want to teach this? And his, he said, well, you know, I, I do advise the students a lot on, you know, that are doing my certificate right. about where to, you know, where to get jobs. And, you know, he has a lot of connections in the community. So I'm like, yeah. And, he, and his response was, yeah, I guess I could do this. He said, it's good for the CEO to, like, to, to take a shift, like, like being the dishwasher, or, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I was just like, I was like, okay. Right. Yeah, I think you're right. You do it for a semester. But he really likes it now. And now he does it. And he's like. I know. Once you teach the class, you get a little addicted. Like, right? he's having students yeah. look at the, you know, the the um, foundations for the practice of law studies and write like collect papers on it and like, it's great. He's liking it. Yeah. This is building on the same issue and really it comes down to um, taking a really good hard look at your doctoral faculty because they may be more interested than you think. Mm -hmm. I was recruited to go to Stetson because approximately a third of the doctrinal faculty were teaching sort of homegrown externships. Um, and they, they finally got, and it, it was like a community garden with no walls. Not <laughs> 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 um, But they really care about these programs or courses. And I was asked to come in and sort of help them, them feed. Um, and plan intentionally. Mm -hmm. And it was, you know, I did a lot of work, and Chrissy's continuing the work and, and furthering it. I, I wanted to circle back while I have the floor um, to something else. And sometimes there are fights about what you do and how you do it that have nothing to do with externship. But it's a, a piece of a political fight or game that's bigger than any one piece. Mm -hmm. So I think you have to take a, a wider view. Are they really concerned about experimental education? Are they really concerned about the externship? Or is there something else going on that you can extricate yeah. Can I say two things? One, that I, I want us to remember, again, I want to give credit to Kate because you reminded me of this this morning. We are curricular. We are part of the curriculum. We teach in the same way. Our students get the same credits that are, you know, they get for every other course that count towards graduation, regardless of where we are, regardless of how we're staffed. That, to me, should be empowering. We'll we talk more about it tomorrow. Our planner is going to focus on it tomorrow. But that should be empowering to us. And I would encourage you. I There are times, and I'm married to an associate dean and a doctrinal professor, and I have to remind myself of that. So be empowered by that, because it is our time. And that is not going to change. I hope Sandy was wrong this morning. But we so remind yourself of that. And that's a message that needs to come from us often in a way that's educating others who either don't want to hear it or don't understand it, whether they're willing to hear it or not. Two, I think we need to sell our successes in a way that translates to what our colleagues are doing, whether they're clinical colleagues teaching in-house, or they're doctrinal colleagues who have nothing to do with experiential education, or other constituencies that we deal with. Again, preview for tomorrow, and I don't want to talk about it for long, but the University of Memphis doesn't place students and postgraduate clerkships in great numbers. But I will say, because of our externship program, last year in a graduating class of 100, we had nine. Nine postgraduate federal clerkships. Two with a Sixth Circuit judge who hires students because of our externship program. She's graduated by law school. But you better believe I was telling everybody who would listen in our faculty meetings about that. Because that's a direct outgrowth of our externship course. And we, that's not just teaching our students, that's fostering and broadening our reputation locally and nationally. And I think that's part of how we integrate 
and how we, we work to build support for our program managers. Celebration is really, really, really important. But not just numbers, a story. Sure, that's right. You had this student going through this externship, she's now working for this judge, and let your alumni office know about it. Whatever, whatever information they're setting out there, that's a story, and those stories can be really powerful. And, and oh, wow. And you know who likes it? You know who likes those stories? Students like those stories. <laughs> alums, and professors alums. tend to, they do, and professors tend to listen People those who, the alum who hired that student loves that student. Yeah. And we'll, we'll do it again. Yeah. yeah. And that it is a way, I mean, the isolation comes in part because we're, we don't get the story out, which I think is next, is uh, tomorrow's plenary. Yes. Yeah. Get the story out. So. Uh, we, are, we are here to help and love doing this. I, I, for me, it was both cathartic and uplifting <laughs> to be talking with, with Avis about this over the course of the last month. And I don't want to speak for, I think I can speak for both of us in saying, call us, talk. It, we, we, we feel your pain. And we're in this with you. And I think this community, even within the, the clinical community, is, is there for one another in this kind of way. So share your stories with, with each other and with us. And let us know if we can, we can help um, in any way. Thank you for talking with us.